morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Duan and everyone who put on this great event. I'm John Hart from MIT, uh, and uh, it was a joy to put this talk together as a kind of retrospective of how I got into the field of additive manufacturing with a bit of computation, and also as a thank you to the many folks who have helped out uh, with many of our programs at MIT over the past 10 years. And while I'll share a bunch of things I'm really proud of, I want to emphasize, number one, this has been an entirely organic process. Number two, it takes a community to do what we've done. And number three, if you're starting something new, whether it be a new class or a new company uh, or a new research project, things can be really unclear at the early stage, and I encourage you to stick with it, especially in terms of creating opportunities for new products using digital manufacturing technology, which I believe is uh, what will define the next decade and help us solve some of the most important problems that the world faces. So uh, 10 years ago this summer, I came to MIT. This is a picture from our commencement. Uh, the faculty walking in just a couple weeks ago, I show this because I don't know why the parents are taking pictures of the faculty. It's really the students, but also because you know, here's the, the main building where the president's office is. And when I came to MIT in that summer of 2013, one of the first things I saw in a colleague's office was this, which is a model of that same building printed in roughly 1990 on some of MIT's first 3D printers. MIT did not invent 3D printing overall, but our colleagues, Ellie Sachs, Michael Seema, and their team invented binder jetting, the first technology that was called 3D printing. And perhaps just as, if not more impressive than this artifact, made out of like a plaster powder or a ceramic, was that they had a highly detailed CAD model that they basically etched manually uh, in uh, the CAD platform uh, 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 of the day. And they and the many other pioneers of our industry like really had it all. They wrote papers, they built industry consortia, they spun out companies, they thought of the applications, but I think we'd all agree it was a technology before its time, uh, which applies to many new hardware technologies, technologies that require the integration of physical assets and, and digital assets. But this inspired me to start looking into additive manufacturing as an area of research and education. And in fact, when I applied to MIT, I had nothing about this in my research statement. And that's not to say, well, we've come a long way, but to say that I was in the right place at the right time to start something new. And I had one observation and one key opportunity. The observation was that MIT as a university was not doing much in this area, in spite of its heritage. And the key opportunity was actually brought on by a colleague to meet a group of master's students in manufacturing and teach a new course. So I actually started by teaching a course uh, in the fall of 2013 to this group of master's students, uh, 15 or so students from around the world, uh, a very diverse group, all with interest in learning the fundamentals of manufacturing and combining it with their own industry experience. So I was able to put together a course that was actually for me and the tools and in terms of their connection to manufacturing at scale. And the questions you have to answer when you take a new production technology uh, to uh, industrial scale and particularly the source of variation. So the core of the project was studying those fundamental principles and uh, a project, and this is emphasized in the sort of thesis for the Masters of Engineering program itself, which is still a small program but continues to this day. And among many projects in the class, uh, we were able to uh, basically, just because we were MIT, jump the line for the Form 1 machine. So Form Labs at that time, now they've sold tens of thousands of machines, was just at its infancy. And we got a couple of the machines for the class. And one of the teams of students chose to study post-curing. So you may know that in stereolithography, you often need to put the part uh, under UV light uh, after it's printed to finish the curing process. And they developed in guidelines for that when Form Labs was still at the early stage and their guideline, I kid you not, was to put the part on the windowsill for a certain number of days. Uh, so we've come a long, long way. But it was these kinds of sort of basic process-oriented insights that got us started and were really on the minds of the students uh, at that time. 
The next semester, I decided to teach it again, but teach it at a bigger scale to a broader set of students. And we didn't have a big budget, but we formalized the lab setup, and each team of students had access to a desktop SLA printer, a $600 extrusion printer, a 3D scanner, and we ended up writing a paper with Jameson, who was the TA, who was as, as, as much or more enabler of the course as I was, who had come to MIT from his undergraduate at Georgia Tech. And one of the assignments leading up to the final project we came up with was the bridge competition. So we challenged the students working in teams to design a bridge to be 3D printed. And in, in typical fashion, we sort of give the students requirements and give them guidance, but just let them have at it with whatever software tools available to them or we provide to them. <coughs> and uh, we tested the bridges live during class, brought an Instron machine into the classroom. And as you might expect, there was great variety in the solutions presented, the same kind of variety as you might see using tools today. But we had nature-inspired designs. The one in the middle is like modeled after the bill of a toucan, which has been studied for its mechanical properties. There were very well-modeled multi-material designs, here taking you know, SLA parts for their high compressive strength and uh, extrusion parts for their high toughness, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, we failed to consider that the students would actually defeat us and beat the competition. Uh, so the winning the bridge design was this, uh, which uh, you may realize is a single piece. So I, I forgot to say that one of the key rules was that the span from one end of the test fixture to the next was bigger than any part that they were allowed to print in a printer. But we didn't think that you could make a part that would unfurl like so. And so this team designed a bridge, so to say, that was a strap to be loaded in tension. And they printed this in one piece on one of those $500 printers. And they also oriented the printing in the direction of the highest stiffness and strength in the direction of extrusion. So they more or less achieved the theoretical strength of the material. And we normalized the criteria by the mass of the bridge. So they broke the competition. Right? There's no better answer than that. And it's just, a, I think, to this day, a beautiful example of how like, human creativity can be more powerful than what the process or the computing engine can give you. Uh, and then we had a, a bunch of semester projects. And this was a really dedicated, like, hardworking group of students from different disciplines. And we had a printer that printed ice cream. It's the first time I actually had a, something fed to me during the final exhibition. Uh, they, again, sort of hacked this up with a soft serve ice, soft serve ice cream maker, with a freezer, with a, a, a carved up extrusion printer, and it, it didn't taste bad. Uh, and we also had the first version of a glass printer, which you may have seen in the press, that was taken on by Professor Neri Oxman and her group, and her students built the first version of this. So I think it's cool we had like from very cold printing to very, very hot printing, and these students do this in part in the MIT glass lab and get you know, glass out of a hot furnace and so on. So it was really like striking to me to see this full span of outcomes just by giving the students interested in the topic the tools to come up with their own ideas and come up with their own concepts and prototype them in the span of about 14 weeks. So then we turn to thinking how do we work with industry? Uh, and many companies come through campus, and if you're from a university, you might have the same thing. And we launched an annual one-week summer course where instead of building a machine, too much to do, of course, in one week, we have kind of your standard uh, design competition using software provided by Autodesk uh, and others over the years. And the final competition is uh, we, we hang a kettlebell or a series of kettlebells on a coat hook, and this fits in addition to the lectures and other activities into the span of just two or three days. And it, it's fast enough to design and prototype that the teams are able to iterate quickly, which is really important when learning how to use this technology. And we had about 60 professionals every summer for one week come from all around the world and spend this week uh, with us as kind of a boot camp. And it was a really wonderful experience to get to know those folks and to see how the uh, uh, participants interact with one another, having widely varying levels of experience and being from very different industries uh, and, and, and seeing how that is also a powerful way that bonds connect when you work on uh, additive and digital manufacturing. But then the question became, like, how do we scale this? 
uh, because the audience is much bigger than the folks we can address uh, online. And maybe that was a little bit more of a forward-thinking thing than today when maybe it's obvious you, you teach online and you create mixed experiences. But we uh, were inspired by actually what was my, my main teaching assignment, which was teaching traditional manufacturing to our undergraduates. So in mechanical engineering, which is my department, uh, we have a manufacturing processes class with the same kind of theory plus project approach, but the main project is the students design and make their own yo-yos in quantity of 100, and they do the CAD, they do the CAM, they do the molding and assembly and so on. And as part of evolving that part of our curriculum, I got familiar with the process of capturing videos in studios that uh, MIT had. So this is a, a technique called the light board, uh, where you stand behind a pane of glass uh, I think it was invented by a professor at NYU, and you write on the glass if you want to lecture with some equations, and it sort of inverts the image and is a very convenient way to produce. So we launched an online version of this undergraduate class and had many thousands of people take it, and that enabled us to then have the workflow, not the content, to do the same for professional audiences in additive manufacturing. So for the past five years or so, we've had an online course that we, uh, for short, called AMX, and uh, many folks, including uh, Duan, uh, contribute to this as teaching assistants and as experts, and the course was designed as a 10-week experience for industry professionals. Not a full-time experience, but like many professional courses, takes a few hours a week, uh, and we try to do everything from end to end in that span of time. So we begin by introducing the technology, talking about the processes, going over a spectrum of applications, and then spend the heart of the course in design, both qualitative and software enabled. And then we wrap up with modules on economics and integrative case study, and then many interviews on the future of manufacturing. And this has been a very successful and rewarding experience for us, seeing the number of individuals in the uh, industry who have taken this course and given us very, very useful feedback. It also struck me how this is a you know, a largely sort of untapped opportunity for us to take the kinds of things as educators that we're teaching to students on campus and then share them to the world in other ways, just like that was the motivation for the big online manufacturing course a couple minutes ago. And just for some numbers, we've had about 7,500 people take this course, some just on their own, uh, and some, a few companies with a few hundred, if not more than a thousand uh, learners enrolled in the course. And it's interestingly bimodal in terms of the level of experience. We have participants all across the spectrum with many, many years of experience. And again, a way to access a professional audience who is far beyond their regular university studies. And it get good rep for sort of career uh, advancement. And in spite of it being a very comprehensive course, uh, invariab invariably uh, about half of the learners in our exit survey say they want more. They want to learn more about these particular details that they're most interested in and use the course as a knowledge base. And so that's something we're thinking very much about uh, with regard to our, our future programming. So uh, I kind of thought of you know, powers of 10. So you may know this film from the Eames in 1977, sort of zooms out and zooms back in across link scales. So in 10 years teaching at MIT, uh, I've, I've taught about 1,000 students on campus, largely in that undergraduate course. In the online course, we've been able to reach about 10,000 professionals, and that is a pseudo-business because to produce the course, MIT has to recover its costs and so on. But through the open online course, uh, Introduction to Manufacturing overall, we've reached over 100,000 students who have enrolled in the course, and individual videos have been viewed millions of times, which is really rewarding to think of the reach you can get by uh, you know, putting out what you teach on campus to bring uh, feedback back into, uh, into the university. And it really is a closed loop. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't gotten started with education in mind before I did any research in the field or before got into working with industry and entrepreneurship uh, as well. Uh, and, and, and this could be arranged in any way, but education and research go hand in hand along with engagement in industry, along with growing and interfacing with the community. So uh, it, due to like COVID, of course, I didn't teach the on-campus course for five years. 
uh, uh, and along with other reasons. But we did it again just this semester. We did the bridge competition again. We changed the rules so the students couldn't break the competition using that, that stretchy piece of material. Uh, and the winning bridge was actually this one. We gave them Fusion, we gave them NTOP, and there were really no designs solely derived from those tools, but it was cool to see the inspiration of these uh, sort of computational design tools on their design process and interpretation of the requirements. And they also fought all the you know, hassles that we see uh, when, when we use the software today, right? How do you combine the conventional CAD with the lattices and so on and so forth? And uh, one bridge was particularly interesting. This was not the winner. It would have been if it hadn't failed at the joints that they could have designed better, but this was designed using the uh, code developed by a few graduate students working in another professor's research group that does research in topology optimization. So another great example of, of research and education going hand in hand. And instead of building new kinds of printers, because there's more than enough of that already, uh, we focused the project on concepts for new products. And so the students were really creative in coming up with things entirely own their own ideas with just a little bit of framing in terms of how to think about a value proposition. And two examples, one, uh, this team that does research on mechanics of lattice structures really likes coffee and like coffee science. So they modeled and prototyped a coffee filter to set the pressure drop in a handheld espresso pump. Uh, and they got really, really interesting data and made this thing by LPBF. And the economics might work out if you do the production at scale. And then this team, uh, uh, led by Marwa, who uh, works in a computer science lab for her PhD, uh, really likes cooking. And so they came up not with uh, sort of the same kind of additively manufactured product, but a way to fold dumplings using little fixtures that are 3D printed on a flexible substrate. They called it bakery, like bakery. Uh, and again, I got to like eat at the final presentations. Uh, and like this is just so cool and something you would never expect happening at the end, uh, at, at the outcome of the class. You'll see uh, her fold uh, the uh, dumpling wrapper here, and, and after the video stops, they actually insert a piece of chocolate and put it in the air fryer right uh, on demand. So those are just some examples of innovation to product innovation. But ultimately, to me, product and process innovation are inseparable. Right? You cannot innovate products without understanding process. And this is a core, at the core of all our discussions beyond additive about like, how we rebuild industry, new industries in the US and elsewhere. Because one thing we've lost by offshoring a lot of manufacturing, even though there are often very good reasons for it, and it will not shift, is this tight connection between product and process innovation. So back to the industry course, uh, one of the participants from maybe five or six years ago uh, actually w is the director of, of the creative team and engineering team at Stern Pinball. And so I love playing pinball as a kid. And over COVID, I impulse bought a pinball machine. That's Elise, who's three, playing pinball in the basement. Uh, and George and, I stayed, George and I stayed in touch. And I got to visit their facility right next to O'Hare Airport a couple months ago. And uh, I thought this was incredible for many reasons. But number one, they're a 500 or so person company that goes from the concept to the product out the door in one facility. Number two, this product is incredibly complex and there's so much knowledge built into it. Uh, uh, at number three, their supply chain is almost largely domestic. Very few, as he told me, of their components come from overseas. And I also thought when he came to the class, wow, they're gonna start 3D printing so many things. But actually, the answer is, is no. There's really no production use cases yet, but there's a lot of use cases in prototyping, like this uh, Mecha Godzilla character from the Godzilla pinball machine. And one interesting reason why this is not 3D printed is, as he told me, just the, the cost and the mechanical properties of full color 3D printing, especially when things are going to be hit by a, by a pinball many, many times are not quite there yet. But you can see the potential, and you can see the potential for this integration, I think, as the technology goes forward. And there are so many beautiful 
use cases out there. I'm sure just by getting closer to the product opportunities and the businesses that can leverage it. So uh, one more short story before I wrap up. Actually, going back to the, that group of students, uh, you know, it's all about the people in the end. So one of the people in this group uh, uh, in 2013 was Martin Feldman, uh, who uh, is looking very serious right here. He never wears a suit uh, uh, now. Uh, and he and I had an idea to start a company a couple years after we met in that class. He stayed around MIT after his master's, worked in my lab, actually wasn't working on 3D printing, but we had an idea for a company that would bring a new approach to laser powder bed fusion, metal 3D printing, to industrial scale. Uh, and uh, in 2015, we founded the company, just hired the lawyers, we supported ourselves for a couple years. I remained at MIT, and Martin really did the, did the hard work, built a first prototype, and we raised a seed round of funding from uh, a, a, a venture capital firm uh, on the West Coast called Eclipse in 2017. And about five years later, we've built our technology into a large factory about one hour west of Boston. Uh, and there's still a long way to go. Like, this is not proven. Uh, we have to bring the company actually to like real scale and real products. But at that early stage, you know, we had no idea we would get this far. And again, to that point of number one, enabled by education and, and, and relationships, and two, just, just thinking forward, being, being committed to the ideas and the vision that you have. And we at the company uh, produce, we don't sell our hardware. Uh, like many others, we produce finished parts and, and products, not just additively, but with heat treatment and machining to try to present an integrated value chain. And to me, the real proof is in those beautiful products that come out from the technology, and the processes are just an enabler. So here's a big uh, 600 by 600 build plate, uh, Inconel uh, 718 guide vane, that's sort of a marketing component, but similar geometry that would be in a real small-scale jet engine. And here's an array of, of hip cups for uh, uh, use in hip implants. And what's been very uh, important to us, additional tools to help us take the part design with customers and plummet through the process. So not only are there some uh, unique attributes of our equipment in terms of how it achieves productivity and consistency, but also we have a full internal pipeline to simulate the process thermomechanically, make any necessary corrections, and then sensors in the machine that let us collect data that allow us to learn faster, and in some cases create a kind of digital twin of the build. Uh, and then wrapping up in the next minute or two, back at MIT, uh, while I'm very excited about what we've been able to do, we're actually like 10 to 20 years behind many other great schools like Penn State, Ohio State, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, you name it, uh, in our shared facilities to enable our community to innovate with these technologies. But we are just uh, starting a new program funded in large part by the state of Massachusetts, along with an equal contribution from industry, uh, eight to $10 million in total, to build new labs where we will bring end-to-end -end processes for digital manufacturing, for metals, polymers, other materials, and we will try to overlay those with uh, work on augmented reality-based training, as well as hands-on training, and use it as a kind of incubator for new process architectures that can push the limits in particular areas. And it's really important with us that we work to us that we work closely with industry. And you just see a few of our partners who uh, signed on to support the proposal here. By far, not all, and have this alignment between the pull of the users and the capabilities provided by the technology providers. And I think these facilities can be a really sort of fertile ground for that kind of dialogue, sort of pre-competitive, not competitive dialogue, and support all the other elements that I shared with you today. So quickly, what's next? Well, building these labs and growing industry partnerships, focusing more on product innovation workshops and challenges, building the next generation of our online course, AMX, and extending that with partners across the industry, and also by you know, evolving our group of alumni into more of a continuing community. And last, that might be a little weird, but I really believe in, like, in open techno-economic models that would allow us to understand in a shared fashion 
What's the intersection between the process capability that can enable a certain designer product and the economics? And I think we need a, some kind of effort across the community to share more data about like what it costs and what are the ingredients of that cost and how that matches with applications. And if that is more transparent, it's a very tall order. I think there will be more uh, adoption uh, of the technology even when other things uh, like you know intrinsic capabilities and cost itself move on slower time scales. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, look forward to meeting you this afternoon.